The Briefs continues at nine on Thursday night. But now I dare you not to sing and dance along as we celebrate Stock Aiken and Waterman, the hit factory. Twenty-five years ago, the powerhouse production team of Stock Aiken and Waterman launched their record label PWL and were at the top of their game. No one could ignore the success. They seemed to get up in the morning, in the afternoon, the team had written a hit. It was hit after hit after hit. It was like they had the gold wand and everything they touched just turned to gold. The year was 1987. They'd taken Mel and Kim to the top of the charts. We were living the dream, basically. It was brilliant. Never gonna give you and made Northern lad Rick Astley into an international superstar. Everybody thought this was a black guy from Chicago. And soon a soap star called Kylie would help turn their hit factory into a brand of British pop that for the next three years would dominate the charts. From 1984 to 1993, the pop production team of Stock Aiken and Waterman scored 13 number one singles, over 100 top 40 hits, and were crowned the best songwriters in the country three years running. If you listen to those songs, great chord structures, fantastic songs. They became famous for their trademark sound. They're always the songs that get you on the dance floor their upbeat hits, and their loud mouth leader. Give me a J! Pete had these wonderful, crazy ideas about how to promote my career with Stock Aiken Warman. I guess the idea was to really create hysteria, really. From their studios in South East London, they planned to take over the pop charts and create a British Motown for the 1980s. I think I actually said that very early on. This is like Tamla Motown, you know, they've got Kylie and Jason and she's their Diana Ross. Their hit factory of pop sold millions of records, delivered a fresh new wave of pop stars and a few harsh critics. Part of the Socket and Autumn experiment was to get unknown people to sing songs. Anyone with a half-decent voice could be made a pop star. Tonight, we celebrate the hits, the history, and the days when Mike Stock, Matt Aiken, and Pete Waterman were the kings of British pop. This musical tale begins in 1984. Frankie goes to Hollywood for dominating the charts. Margaret Thatcher was dominating the minors. And Pete Waterman was sitting in London looking to build a new empire. Everybody forgets, but I've been incredibly successful from 74 onwards, you know. And certainly by 83, I signed Musical Youth and we had number one all over the world, which I produced with Peter Collins. When I came back from living in and working with musical youth in America and Canada, I determined that that's, I was going to set up my own thing. I was going to do my own thing. Professional musicians Mike Stock and Matt Aiken had worked together in cabaret bands and had recently teamed up to develop their long-standing ambition to write and produce pop songs. And when they knocked on Pete Waterman's door, the timing was perfect. And so Mike and Matt, they played me this one song which was called Agents on Aeroplanes, The Upstroke. The upstroke, the upstroke. I heard it and I said, OK, I know exactly what to do with this. Pete organised for the record to be released and it was the first ever single from Stock, Aiken and Waterman. The first piece of business that we did properly with Pete was Upstroke. And it was somewhat influenced by Frankie Goes to Hollywood, which failed to trouble the top 75, but, um, you know, has its admirers. John Peel championed it, so it's ironic that John Peel was the first person ever to play a Stock Aiken Waterman record. You know, not a lot of people would have thought of that, but he did. With the team in place, their next record made an impact with more than DJ John Peel. 
breaking into the charts in July 1984, their first hit record wasn't by a sunny Australian soap star or a blue-eyed boy from the north. That accolade belongs to a six-foot drag queen straight from the gay clubs of New York. Cult movie star and drag queen Divine had come to London to record a club track, and much to everyone's surprise, the new working production trio of Stock, Aiken and Waterman made it a hit. I put the TV on one night and Divine was on top of the pops. Now that was, you know, groundbreaking for me. You're seeing someone of that size and someone of that height singing a song with that growly voice. It was just a complete culture shock. Technology for me was what had to change that record. So we really spent hours and hours and hours over every part of the song because it wasn't our song. Turn around. We had to really work on the, the sound because once you saw the mine, you either fell off your chair laughing or you walked out the room and switched the telly off. Hot from the gay clubs of London and New York, Divine's hit was part of a new era of high-tech, high-energy dance music. In those days, high energy was kind of the successor to disco and my mother actually was a high-energy disco queen and had the track So Many Men, So Little Time. So I was very familiar with that. I think it was supposed to be the fastest music in the world, 120 beats per minute, um, lots of electronic sounds, and it was just a really fresh sound of the future. And that sound was exactly what singer Hazel Dean was looking for. But this time, the song they created would give the fledgling production team their first top ten hit. Whatever I do, wherever I go, I'm never coming back to you. Whatever you do, wherever you go, I'm gonna get over you, over you. Whatever I Do was written by Stock Aitken and Waterman, and really that was their first song as writers and me as their artist. Hazel Dean's record seemed to be a class of record inspired by gay disco, but which had taken on pop overtones. It was very catchy, very infectious, and she was a good singer. They were experimenting themselves. With, with this sort of stuff. It was new to them, it sounded great, you know, and they got latest technology and it just sounded stunning. We had a little radio alarm clock um, at home, it used to go off at 10 o'clock in the morning, and just, I, I'd hear a lot of records, but I wasn't paying attention to them, and, they, uh, and the first one I noticed purely for the syndromes on it was Hazel Dean's Wherever I Go, Whatever I Do. And I heard that sound, I thought, you know, that's kind of good enough for me, really. I got this call from Pete Burns' manager when I meet with Pete Burns. I mean, he was a fan. There was no question he knew exactly what the records were about. Uh, he knew exactly what we were trying to do. The band were writing tracks for their second album and played the producers a demo of their latest song. So he played me this song. And I went, oh my God. So what's he called? He said, spin me around. I said, that's it. That's the one. The minute he heard that track, and it went right above my head, you know, he went, press the girls, this is the number one, this is the number one. Then I said, yeah, 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 OK. Uh, and I just didn't take it seriously. But the band's record company weren't convinced that the trio's high-energy club sound was right for Dead or Alive. The record company quite bluntly said, that's just music for queers. It's not going to get anywhere. The band stuck to their guns, and when the producers revealed the final mix, everyone was excited. And I watched Pete Burns' face. I mean, Pete Burns was literally like a child in a candy store. He lit up. It was just like he was singing whatever he was going to sing, and they were constructing whatever kind of track they wanted to construct. And you put them together, and, and, and the tension was amazing. The record company were proven wrong when You Spin Me Round made it to number one in March 1985. 
and broke into the American Top 20. It was the first of Stock Aiken and Waterman's 13 number one singles. Their hit-making skills would soon be in high demand, and there would be one very young pop mogul pestering Pete for a hit. When I first met him, I was begging him to work with me on one of my artists. Twenty-five years ago, pop producers Stock, Aiken and Waterman launched Rick Astley, Kylie Minogue and their iconic record label PWL. Success with high-energy tracks for Divine and Dead or Alive inspired Banana Rama to ask the team to produce their classic cover version of Venus. In 1985, as the team were setting up their new recording studio, experiments with 80s R&B sounds led to this rare track with 70s trio The Three Degrees. It failed to make the top 40, but one of the producer's regular backing singers, Desiree Heslop, would soon take them back to the top 10. Stock Aitken Wharton had written this song, Say I'm Number One, and, uh, and had demoed it. And Pete had it in mind, I can't remember numbers, and a major artist. I think they had it set up for, I think it was DC Lee, I think, and even, uh, gosh, who was the other? I think it was Bucks Fig. But with the demo sounding so good, Matt and Mike wanted the backing singer to get the song for herself. They decided that they liked how my voice matched it, and that's how it worked. They played it to me and I'd gone, I'd got goosebumps. Got to the chorus, I'd got goosebumps. Desiree was managed by her brother Don, and before the track was released, he convinced her that he had the perfect plan to launch her career as a pop star. We have a royal family in music. We have king, we have queen, we have prince, we don't have a princess. So he said, you're going to be called princess. I said, no, I'm not, no. I said, I've got a perfectly lovely name. I don't want to be called princess. I don't need that kind of pressure. He then told Pete, and Pete's response was, well, that's a dog's name, isn't it? Pr princess? 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 And Don said, don't you notice? How many times have you said it, though? If you compared it to the high energy records they'd made previously, it's worlds apart. It's, it stood there on its own. But even now, if you listen to it, it's, a, it's one of those timeless records. Now with a taste for developing their own stars, when two cool hackney girls arrived at their door, Pete, Mike and Matt soon realised that the songs and the sounds for Mel and Kim would have to match their vibrant personalities. I absolutely love that video because it is 100% Mel and Kim, from the dance routines to the outfits. And we've got such an attitude in that video as well. And they were, I have to tell you, larger than life. This gave us a real uh, focus to write the songs. They gave a lot of thought with Mel and Kim to the persona. These were girls living the life, living the dream, and that came across so well in the songs. It was great that showing that was specifically written for us, and when you listen to the verses, it's so us. It was all about just having great fun, and it was great that Mike, being the lyricist, was able to to put that down on paper. People looked at them and they looked like these Paris fashion models in some of the photo shoes, but when they opened their mouths, they're these like really cool East End girls with a sense of humor. Now, as sisters growing up, did you used to like to sing and dance together? Yeah, we sing a lot together. Well, yeah. Well, we still do that. <laughs> <laughs> I think we were very fresh at the time, but everyone was thinking, what can they do next? One hit wonders. The public loved the cool Cockney girls, and even a tabloid revelation about Mel's past couldn't dent their popularity. You used to do a bit of modelling, didn't you? I did, yeah. I've done it for about a year or so. A bit of page three. A bit of page three, yeah. 
I remember the day we went into the studio to record the second single. We had no idea what we were going to record. And up on the screen was respectable. Take or leave us, honey, please believe us. We ain't ever going to be a respectable. It's our occupation. We're a dancing nation. We keep the pressure on every night. The Mel and Kim stuff was just full of personality and vibe and energy. I mean, I'm respectable. They take, I mean, that's us genuinely laughing between ourselves and and uh, they would then chop it up and it would end up on the record. <laughs> For me, that's where they were really clever. In one day, it sold 50,000 copies. And in total, it sold 800,000 in the UK. I think worldwide, it did over 2 million singles. <laughs> How big do you think they could become? I think they could be, I think they will be the female equivalent of Wham by the end of this year. It was a great time. You know, Melanie's 19, I'm 23, almost 24. We were living the dream, basically. But just two months later, as Respectable was topping the charts around the globe, the whirlwind success of Mel and Kim came crashing down to earth. We really found out that Mel was ill when she was in Japan just this persistent pain in her back and we had to cancel all the dates we couldn't do anything i think we spent two weeks in the hotel because we couldn't move melanie and that's when i knew this wasn't about the dance routines and it wasn't until we got back and that um she went to bart's and then they diagnosed her with cancer mel didn't want anyone to know so we we put a complete press ban on it she just wanted to take the chemotherapy carry on doing whatever work she could do, but did not want it exposed to the press. The story of Mel becoming ill was such a shock because she was so young, and also they did everything they could in a really noble attempt to kind of cover it up. But you're on your own today. Yep, that's Great right. Great to see you on your own. Oh, Melanie's in hospital at the moment. Oh, what's she done? Slip this. Oh, I'll give her a little wave. How is what she? Camera we're looking into. Hi, Mel. <laughs> Hi, get better soon. <laughs> Mel didn't recover from her illness, and the duo never performed on stage together again. Shockingly, Mel died in January 1990, aged just 23. But her spirit still remains in the hits of Mel and Kim. By 1987, the Hit Factory Studios were stepping up a gear and delivering yet more top 10 hits for Banana Rama, Pepsi and Shirley, and Samantha Fox. The hit writing talents of Stock Aiken and Waterman were now in demand by all the biggest record companies, and one aspiring pop mogul in particular was desperate for Pete Waterman to grant him a hit. I can remember the first time I met Pete. One of the most egotistical, arrogant, difficult people I've ever met in my life, but also one of the most talented. Pete hated Simon, Mike Stott hated Simon, Mike Aitken hated Simon, and Simon couldn't get into the building to get a record made. When I first met him, I was begging him to work with me on one of my artists. And Simon said, look, I've met Pete, he's finally returned my phone call, and he, I think he's going to work with us. He was chasing us, and then I suddenly picked up the News of the World on a Sunday, and there was uh, Sunita with her toy boy, and I thought, that'll do me, that'll do, there's a start, there you go. And Pete phoned Simon up and went, come in, mate, I've got your song. And we went in, and it was Toy Boy. I wasn't actually signed to PWL. I was signed to Simon's record company, Fanfare. But Stocking and Waterman wrote my songs, some of my songs, which was genius for us, because otherwise Simon and I would have had to write them, which would have been a disaster. <laughs> I always thought the mix between Sunita and Stock Aiken and Waterman would be amazing. It was a relationship that worked, and I think it was great for Sunita and it was great for me. In the first six months of 1987, the production trio had scored two number one singles and ten top 40 hits, even making the charts themselves with the disarmingly cool dance track, Roadblock. this success was about to be eclipsed by the most unlikely of stars, Rick Astley. Newton Le Willows, Rick's birthplace, only has one other real claim to fame. 
was the first town in the world where someone was killed by a train. Here in this quiet northern social club, Rick's first manager persuaded Pete Waterman to come along and hear his fledgling new act. This is Monks' social club, which is at Wollstone at Warrington. And uh, this is a stage uh, that Rick was first seen on by Pete Waterman. Loving Rick's voice, the producers spent over a year nurturing their new act. And in the summer of 1987, they were finally ready to launch the slick sounds of Rick Astley to an unsuspecting public. Suddenly everybody thought this was a black guy from Chicago and it was a white guy with red hair from Newton the Willows. I mean, and you know, that was the shock. This was the shock. I mean, everybody believed, of course, that, you know, it was Luther Vandross doing guide vocals and we were, just weren't telling people. It went on a BBC Northwest local news programme and we never looked back. It just went poof, straight into the charts. Uh, my name's Rick Astley, I've come to go on top of the pops. Oh, fine, right. If you'd like to go over to the studio, it's Studio One. We found out it was doing Toilet the Pops, and there used to be a, a store called Take Six in... Uh, there was one in King's Road, and there was one in Oxford Street. So we rocked off down there, me and one of the girls, and we bought in this navy blue double-breasted suit. And that's what we did Toilet the Pops with. And where are you from? Outside Manchester? In the Willows, it's called, just outside Warrington. Congratulations. Thanks a lot. See you on set. All right. Okay, thanks. You can't stop a great voice with a great song. You know, you couldn't you couldn't stop that record. Stand the race in one. Coming to five. The track knocked Michael Jackson off the top of the UK charts and stayed there for five weeks. The single repeated the same trick across the globe making number one in 24 other countries, including America. Not only was it a shock to Rick's system, it was a shock to our system as managers. We were working from Latchford Village, above a fancy dress shop that we owned. Now and again, we'd be upstairs, ironing the Pink Panther costume. On the line, you'd have me or Tony talking to somebody in Japan who were doing a multi-million pound deal for, for, for Rick. You know, it was just, it was bizarre. I was with, um, at the Hollywood Bowl, watching Rick and Whitney Houston, you know, just thought he was so cute. Oh, he was, what a love. And that was Rick, you know, that cute little dance he did. Everything was just magic about it. It just worked. Rick Astley's chart success brought the team awards and international attention, but a stroke of luck would give their new record label, PWL, chart domination. People were going out there and buying these records in the truckloads. <laughs>
at one time had as many people from all over the world coming to visit this studio as did Abbey Road. The thing we didn't have was the zebra crossing. And we didn't have the sleeve with Matt, Mike and I walking across it with our bare feet. If we'd have been clever, we'd have done that. There was a buzz before you even got into the studio. It was like being the luckiest teenager in the world, really. This is the boss's office. Right. Terry, the PA. The Lord on the Empire. The Lord on the throne. The Lord, 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 Lord. Lord on the You walk into any room and, and you'd see 100% positivity. Everybody working hard but enjoying themselves. Is it on now? That's oh, yeah. on now, yeah. That's... Okay, then this is Mr. Phil Harding's body. And I think that's why so many artists and industry people enjoyed coming to the building. It was absolute chaos most of the time. But if you like, what I call organised chaos. And in October 1987, amidst the chaos, arrived an Australian soap star keen for a slice of hit factory pop. I got a call from Australia saying, we've got a girl called Kylie Minogue, you should see this girl. She's in a programme called Neighbours, and we'd like you to write and produce the, the singles. Kylie, yeah. Kylie had just had a number one hit in Australia with a cover version of The Locomotion. And her record company were desperate for a follow-up hit. The last thing I needed was another artist in the studio. That's the one thing I didn't need. Mission Records flew Kylie over without, I, I think, very few people knew she was coming, you know? Definitely might stop my aching and Pete Water, but didn't really know. So I accepted this gig without even knowing who Kylie Minogue was. Well, don't even remember accepting the gig, to be totally honest with you. <laughs> She came in reception a few times and then went out, obviously went sightseeing, shopping or whatever she was doing. After eight days waiting, one final visit to the studios left just a few hours to record a song, but nothing had been written. It was only really Mike being such a gentleman, he wouldn't let her down. He said, no, we're going to do it. I remember Matt and Mike sitting at the typewriter, as it were, scratching out the lyrics. Finally got her in, they did a basic track and put her vocal on. So within... I don't know, probably two hours, the basic record was made. Then it was kind of buried for a while. No one did anything with it. Kylie flew back to the set of Neighbours and the track was left unfinished until an unexpected call came from the BBC. The thing that broke the record was a guy called Michael Hurl, who was a BBC TV producer who did Top of the Pops. He also did a thing called Noel Edmonds' Christmas Special. One of the big stars of Neighbours is the lady who plays the part of Charlene. Her name? is Kylie Minogue. Michael Hurl called me from Australia and said, I'm down here, I've seen this new artist, Kylie Minogue, I'm really impressed, I saw her do a performance, I'm told you have her under contract, I'd like to make a video clip and I'd like to pop it into the Noel Edmonds show at Christmas. And you just think, wow, what just happened? Here comes the music and your dedication. I would guess the first time Kylie heard the finished version of I Should Be So Lucky was probably on a playback as she was being filmed in Sydney. The vocal was the same, but it was everything else. The embellishments were, were very different, but, uh, but a great pop record. The record hit the charts in January 1988 and spent five weeks at number one. I Should Be So Lucky became the debut hit for Stock Aiken and Waterman's new record label, PWL, and Kylie Minogue, the pop star, would change the lives of everyone involved. When you get good, that's when you get lucky. And uh, I didn't mean any pun on that, but they got lucky with Kylie. They had to inevitably find their own little princess, and she was it. Kylie was amazing to work with, total professional, able to dance, work to a camera, because that was a training. There was something about her voice which, for me, connected beautifully with what Stockick and Waterman were doing musically. I grew up with all the PWR stuff, Kylie and Sunita. That was my era. Growing up as a kid, that's what you listened to. You used to buy the cassettes, the Hit Factory cassettes, and I remember having them on my little shelf in, in my house with the little cassette player. 
With Kylie Minogue, the team had stumbled upon an untapped market for preteen pop, and the huge record sales were proof that it was a market worth pursuing. She really made an impact with the child market. You know, it was massive. The foundation to the Kylie Minogue empire was the children. Stock Aitken Waterman was selling happiness. Obviously, the TV people loved that. It was fun, youth, and innocence. And that formula really captured people's imagination and uh, interest. And with the formula working, Kylie's boyfriend, Jason, appeared to be the perfect addition to the hit factory. There was a feeling, certainly from David Howells at PWL, there was this guy, Jason Donovan, around, and he had huge potential. Jason came over to meet us, and the phone rings, and Pete Waterman says, your pal, Jason Donovan's still around. Send him down here, we'll put his voice on. Behind the scenes, Rick Astley was reluctant to record Nothing Can Divide Us. The track was done, everything was ready. Jason went in and put his voice on it, and the rest is history. Funny old record, Nothing Can Divide Us. You know, it, it, it's not the easiest melody in terms of journeys. I can understand maybe why Rick Astley rejected it. The best for me was yet to come. And it was something that everyone wanted for Christmas 1988. Kylie and Jason's alter egos had not long married on Neighbours and the public wanted the lovebirds to tie the knot on record too. Especially for you It was supply and demand. I think Kylie at the time was obviously riding the crest of a wave. My currency was on the way up and it just seemed a logical step forward. It really required her blessing probably more than mine at the time, but because I guess we were in a relationship, um, you know, there was a little bit of sort of subtle pressure there and we could all see the potential of where it could go. I do think as a melody and I do think as a piece of songwriting, it's probably one of their best moments. It defines what Mike and Matt were damn good at, looking at individuals, coming up with a great melody. I mean, what a, what a wonderful piece of writing that is. Smash It's and PWL were a great match. It kind of reached a peak when Smash It's put Kylie and Jason on the cover of the week, especially for you, went to number one. And it was the highest selling issue of Smash It's ever, just under a million copies were sold that fortnight. It was just astonishing. Where is he? Where is he? Who? Jason. Jason, what's that right here? He had these wonderful, crazy ideas about how to promote my career with Stock Ake and Waterman. Um, and, you know, I guess the idea was to really create hysteria, <laughs> really. All the way from Australia, please welcome Jason The PWL Roadshow was probably the biggest indicator of where my career was going at that particular point in time. Last night you Stock Ake and Waterman, I think, define great pop music that's appealed to a sort of certain generation. They didn't make excuses for the fact of what it was. To find myself in that fold with the highest selling record of 1989, recording songs with the best producers of that time, you know, I was living the dream. By 1989, no one could ignore the success of Stock, Aiken and Waterman. Not only had they turned Rick Astley into an international singing star, they now had their own record label and two huge stars selling millions of records. But not everyone was happy. People come up to me and go, oh, Stock, Aiken and Waterman are cheesy rubbish, you know, anyone can write that stuff. Well, I'm sorry you can't.
In the late 1980s, pop producers Stock, Aiken and Waterman had delivered unparalleled chart success. They had an incredibly long string of about three years where they were never absent from the chart. They turned soap stars into pop stars, taking kids off the street and straight to the top of the charts. And the record sales proved the public loved it. No one could ignore the success. People were going out there and buying these records in the truckload. The trio's hit factory of pop was now running at full capacity. The media were fascinated by their success, how it worked and just how far these hit makers were prepared to take it. I suppose, I mean, we do have an outrageous ambition. I mean, we're doing pretty well at the moment, I suppose, but we would like to get all ten of the top ten at one point. But as their profile increased, so did the media's scrutiny. critics hated Kylie Ray. Pete and I said that's a bonus. If they don't like it, it's going to be successful. As long as the kid on the street liked it and the kid who went into Wolves on a Sunday went and bought it, that's all we really cared about. I think Kylie and Rick especially struggled with it because they'd go out to the media and some, shall we say, unkind media people would, would say to them, well, how do you feel about being into Stock Aiken Mortimer puppets? You know, and... Uh... Oh, I love it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the thing is, sometimes people tend to take them as just people that press buttons and just machine whatever they're going to do, but... Perhaps it's... in 20 years' time they'll sit back and say, yeah, yeah, that were geniuses. I yeah. mean, it'll take them 20 years to realise. To realise it. As the mouthpiece of the Hit Factory's frustration with the critics, One Hit Wonders The Reynolds Girls faced the wrath of everyone when their single I'd Rather Jack hit the top ten. They'd had so much criticism and so much abuse. So a lot of their frustration came out in this song. You know, they hated music boards who yak on and on about Pink Floyd. It was a bit of an outpouring. It wasn't, you know, it was meant to be tongue in cheek. Oh, the Venom Girls thing was awful. And they deserved the backlash for that. I actually think it's one of their finest singles, but it wasn't existing for that reason. It was existing because they wanted to make that point. But no matter how varied the sound or the artist, the producer's growing domination of the charts led their hits to face the same critique. People come up to me and go, oh, Stock Aiken and Waterman are cheesy rubbish, you know, anyone can write that stuff. Well, I'm sorry, you can't. It's real talent to be able to do that. Anytime you can hit the top 10 spot that many times, you're a good writer. You've got what it takes. By the summer of 1989, the sounds of Stock Aiken and Waterman continued to be the most successful in British pop. Jason had scored his third number one of the year. Kylie's Hand on Your Heart had taken her back to the top of the charts. And when the latest kid to skip from the hit factory floor went straight to the top spot, it seemed almost effortless. Here she is, Sonia! I was 18 when, when we got to number one, but I just didn't expect it to happen. I mean, I don't suppose, you know, anybody would really, because I was complete unknown, do you know what I mean? We were all aware of the fact that, you know, there was a bit of stick in the press, you know. That didn't bother me at all, to be honest. Sonia's hit became the producer's sixth number one single of 1989. Their ambitions to dominate the charts were coming true. But shiny soap stars and chirpy scousers were not the only artists after some hit factory magic. The writers of my next single are Stark Aitken and Waterman. But perhaps 
the most surprising addition to the Hit Factory heatwave of hits that year was the arrival of an American disco diva from the 70s, Donna Summer. For me, their greatest record is the Donna Summer. This time I know it's for real. First of all, it is a great track, and it is a great pop song. But she is also a great vocalist. From the songs to the production, the album was a labor of love for Stock Aiken and Waterman. And as this rare footage reveals, even the image was part of the Hit Factory package that would bring Donna Summer back into the charts. You've got an exceptional singer that is slightly out of her genre. And you've got us slightly out of our genre with a special singer. So you've got just a unique album. During the last three years of the 1980s, the sounds of Stock, Aiken and Waterman had ruled the charts. But the next decade would be a very different story. In January 1990, the Hit Factory enjoyed their 13th number one single with Kylie's cover version of the 50s ballad, Tears on My Pillow. But this would be the last ever number one hit by the production team. We hit the 90s. And suddenly you've got grunge, gangster rap, and Britpop. Well, none of these fit Stock Aiken and Waterman. And music is moving away from them. So to so we're coming through Black Box. I mean, some great stuff. Snap. I've got the power! It was much harder. It was funkier. It was edgier. It, yeah. It, it, it was the 90s. It happens. The times were changing and so were the stars of the Hit Factory. And no more so than the little girl's favourite pop star, Kylie Minogue. The difficulty we had at that point in Kylie's career was that Kylie was obviously very aware of her sensuality and sexuality and was reaching an age where she wanted to show that off. I guess we were like their babies, you know, and we were growing up, and, and to a certain degree, you know, you want to be able to control your children. But no one had control over Kylie, and her sultry new look was at odds with her young fan base. If you take a nine-year-old or an eight-year-old, they don't get it. So at that moment, you go from being the girl next door to their auntie. The all-new Kylie continued to hit the top 10, but without the young kids, the records weren't selling in the same numbers as before, and the pressures for the hit factory to keep its grip on the charts was felt by everyone. The truth is that Kylie and Jason uh, became so big, they became bigger than Stock Aitken Waterman, and we couldn't, we couldn't deal with that. We just couldn't handle it. You know, Kylie needed another hit, Jason needed another hit. I should have sold Kylie the year before to EMI, and just gone back to our roots and started again. But we had 60 staff who nearly paid every month. When there was that backlash against them, I kind of thought they'd disappear for a while, and then they would come, but you know, Pete would get his antennas on again, and they'd come back with a new sound and go, you know, it's not over yet. But obviously it didn't work that way. By 1992, the Stock Aiken and Waterman brand of pop was falling behind, and no amount of reinvention could stop Rick Astley, Sonia, Brother Beyond, and even Jason Donovan from leaving the Hit Factory fold. The team worked really hard to, uh, to carry the success on in the early 90s, but it was, it, it was a struggle. We'd lost Rick by then. Jason was possibly struggling after two albums in terms of freshening up the sound. Kylie, she wanted to move on and, and work with some different people. It was a difficult time, I would say, and Matt Aitken was uh, the first one to throw the towel and say, you know, I've had enough of this. Shortly after completing Kylie's final album for PWL in 1993, Mike Stock and Kylie Minogue left the Hick Factory and an iconic era of British pop was over. The team that had dominated the charts for over nine years and sold millions of records across the globe were no more. 
But the hitmaker's story doesn't end there. In 1994, Mike Stock and Matt Aiken reunited as a production team and produced three number one singles for Robson and Jerome. Pete Waterman remained a regular face on TV and kept the flames of pop alive with the band Steps. But the magic they created when they were Stock Aiken and Waterman remains alive to this day in their classic songs. And perhaps 25 years on, everybody can appreciate the record-breaking achievements of the Hit Factory. You know, they were beautifully crafted pop songs. No one was trying to be cool. It was about a celebration of life, and that puts a big smile on my face. The minute you heard three or four bars of uh, a song, you know it was there. They wrote some fantastic songs, and they were brilliant, brilliant records. Anyone can have a number one. To have 10 or more 10 years in succession, that deserves an Olympic gold medal. They're just songs that you're just never, ever going to forget, and you know them word for word. I just think we made great records. We made great pop songs. People just loved it. So who was singing and dancing along, eh? Now, concluding the documentary exploring the world of criminal law from the perspective of one of Britain's leading legal aid practices, The Briefs, is on Thursday at nine. In a change to tonight's billings, cops with cameras will now follow news at ten, which is next.